So we start with Bernard O'Kane, who is professor of Islamic art and architecture at the American University in Cairo, where he's been teaching since 1980. He's also been a professor at Harvard University and the University of California at Berkeley. He's the, <clears throat> the author of 11 books, numerous articles, and his most recent production is Studies in Islamic Painting, Epigraphy, and Decorative Arts of this year. He is going to address us on Baisengur and emu emulation in the arts of the book Revisited. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Barbara, for that introduction. Uh, so the name of my topic, Emulation in the Arts of the Book, comes from an article by David Roxburgh on two key manuscripts of Kalila Wadimna, one made by painters for the court of Baisongkor in his atelier, the other which is a remounting of earlier Jalayarid paintings. So we're going to be talking about uh, emulation and copying. Let me give you some background. First of all, uh, Sheila Blair, in her, in her study of the Jomea Tavarich, uh, told us, for instance, that emulation and repetition are key elements with every early painting atelier in the history of Islamic art. And this is certainly true. I'm going to show you some examples of this first. Uh, I think Shreev is in the audience here, and she will recognize these as copies from her book on the small Shah Nameh paintings. So in each of these pairs, we see very similar treatments of the same subjects, not quite identical, but enough to show that they were almost certainly produced in the same atelier. And this happens with paintings in many other places and eras in Islamic art. It includes the uh, famous Mamluk school, probably from Syria in the middle of the 14th century, as these three, Kalila and Dimna, painting show clearly the line and the hair episode uh, or uh, the other example that I'm showing from these same three manuscripts in Paris, the Bodleian uh, and uh, elsewhere are of the, the men carrying the treasure, obviously not quite identical, but very much products of the same atelier. And keeping with Kalila and Dimna manuscripts, uh, each of these comparisons are with Jalayarid manuscripts, uh, not such famous ones, but showing the, the Perils of Life episode on the left-hand side uh, with the camel frothing at the mouth, the man in the well, his feet on snakes and the dragon snapping at him from the bottom and uh, large black and white rats chewing at the roots which he is holding on to. We'll come back to these paintings at the very end of my talk today. And on the right hand side, the hypocritical cat, uh, the landscape is slightly different in each case, but very clearly the poses of the main animals were copied or at least uh, done perhaps by the same painter or another painter within the same atelier. So another uh, very famous example of uh, an atelier that very frequently copied motifs from one manuscript to the other is the commercial Turkmen school in Shiraz at the end of the 15th century. <clears throat> there are far too many examples of that to show, but this is a good one of uh, uh, a prince serenading a lover, of course, which goes back a long way in more complicated compositions, even to the Khadju Karamani manuscript from Baghdad. And even such wonderful, fine, renowned painters as Bissad weren't immune from copying, as we see in these two examples of Bahram Gore fighting the dragon, uh, uh, roughly done at the same time. Uh, there are other areas in which copying was very common, and one of those, of course, is in the Istanbul albums. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of these that I could show, for instance, but uh, these three copies of a possibly Chinese original at the top left are very good examples of this. One of them was even uh, thought to be 
worthy enough that it was actually signed by uh, Ustad Shehi Naqash, perhaps the same painter who was mentioned in the colophon of one of the most famous Okuyunlu manuscripts, the Khamsa of Nizami, uh, that is now in the top Kapi Sarai. And another reason for copying may be when a manuscript was particularly famous or perhaps when it was particularly famous and was about to be dismembered. This is the case with the famous Kalila and Dimna <clears throat> from the uh, middle July period, if you want, possibly the, the time of Sultan Oves on the left-hand side, which is now dismembered and in the album for Shah Quli Khalifa in the Istanbul University Library. But before it was cut up, an exact copy with the same placings on the page and almost exactly the same text beside it was made uh, by uh, presumably Shaqwali Khalifa's orders and it's now in the Rampur Raza library in India. So you can see just how close they are on the right hand side. Even though it's a, a Safavid painting on the right hand side, they've maintained very much many of the conventions of the earlier Jalayarid example. Or, uh, Another more surprising example, much closer in date, is the Miraj Naame on the left hand side, copied most likely for Shah Rukh, and then a very similar manuscript for Sultan Abu Said, uh, perhaps just shortly after he had taken control of Timur ud Herat in the 1460s on the right hand side. And in this case, uh, very much an exact copy. Uh, slightly greater difference between two examples here. This is the Rabat Khalilu Wadimna, probably made in Baghdad early in the Ilkhanid period at the top, and a later Arab copy, probably from the 18th century, much less skilled, of course, as you can see at the bottom. <clears throat> and of course, another reason for copying is to make money. And not just to save time necessarily. That's probably the case with the famous Spencer Shahnameh in the New York Public Library that you see in the left, which is in fact a copy of the Baisankur Shahnameh in the Gulistan Library in Tehran. But there are other possible reasons for copying and uh, Ada Adamova has very elegantly delineated these for us in her article showing that in many important manuscripts, painters at a royal court copied three examples from earlier texts, presumably with the idea of establishing that they were part of the classical canon, but also showing how they could, in some respects, not just uh, copy it, but build on it and do better, in fact. And we have, in fact, three examples from the Baisor Gor Shantame which were copied almost directly from the great Jalayarid Shahnameh, whose pages now are also cut up and dismembered in the Istanbul albums. <clears throat> so as Fandiar killing the wolves, we have the, uh, the enchainment of Zahak and Mount Damavand, uh, by some core on the right, the original Jalayarid one on the left-hand side. That didn't jump, let me try again. Uh, did jump okay and then the third one uh, is shown here so three is the key number that we have in many of these examples as Adamova showed and it's not just a case of simple copying to save time it's one that uh, establishes the painter as being within this classical tradition yeah so we move now to these two manuscripts that I will principally be talking about today the original Jalayar manuscript on the right hand side, which for some reason was perhaps damaged and it ended up being dismembered and the paintings were pasted into a new copy of the text that was made for by Uh On the left hand side is the same subject. It's the, uh, the, uh, the thief being beaten in the bedroom after he had tried to slide down a moonbeam. And you can see that uh, one is virtually an exact copy of the other. We of course have information in the Dust Muhammad preface 
that Bai Sung Gor had arranged for the copying of uh, Miscellany of Jung belonging to Sultan Ahmed Jalayir in exactly the same format and size and with the same scenes depicted. So uh, this was very much not out of the ordinary for the Bai Sung Gor Atelier. However, uh, David Roxburgh's article asserts that the cycle of Jalayarid uh, early Timurid paintings, he isn't sure what date they are, served as models for the development of the copy of Baisong Gore's Kalila and Dimna completed in 1429. And he claims that the seven scenes which show the same subject in both manuscripts, uh, that the later one directly engages the earlier paintings, and that they are adaptations of the narrative treatment through composition and manipulation of color and interval and technical execution, that they're reworkings of the original one, hence the title of his article, Emulation. So let's have a look at these similar subjects. Uh, okay, there's quite a lot of similarity. The right-hand side is the Jalayarid original. The Timurid uh, reworking is that on the left-hand side. Little bit of difference in the positioning of the dragon uh, of the arms relative to the head, the size of the rats, the lack of uh, froth coming from the mouth of the camel, but in general, the composition is fairly similar. Rather more difference in the carpenter beating the monkey, uh, the trestle here is supported at the back in the bison gore copy in the Jalayarid original, it's at the front. The monkey is sitting upright on the left. He's lying down on the right-hand side. The carpenter is bareheaded, but uh, has a turban in the Jalayarid original on the right-hand side. The, uh, the pose of the, uh, the carpenter is one leaning forward with his stick instead of leaning backward in the Bisongor copy. So, Rather a substantial difference here, I would have thought. A bit harder to tell with the lion uh, meeting Dimna for the first time. In the Jalayarid original, some of the other court animals are included. Uh, the lions are certainly quite similar in pose and composition. The, uh, the jackal is sitting on his hind legs in the copy and walking in the one on the right hand side, but there's certainly a, a general similarity here. Rather more difference perhaps in the flight of the talkative tortoise. Uh, in the Jalayarid original on the left hand side here, the action is taking place within the text box. Uh, probably the original painting of the tortoise and the geese is lost. This was added, we think, in the Timuri period by Baisong Gore's atelier, but the, the way in which they're gesturing and the angle of their eyes indicated it always was certainly very much in this direction in the margin. Very different treatment here where the, the body of villagers supposedly watching the flight are in the margin and the flight itself is within the text box. So that's a, a radically different arrangement I would have thought of the original. The uh, Monkey Caradone rides the tortoise, another famous episode. These look fairly similar, certainly. I'm not quite sure about the, the landscape on the left-hand side uh, extending into the margin. You can see that perhaps just uh, within this text box that I'm drawing, there's a faint line visible. Uh, it's possible that this indicates the original extent of the Jalayarid painting and, and all of the landscape was added not just the trees, as has been suggested, but we're not quite sure about this. Uh, the pose of these is fairly similar. It's something I'm going to come back to a little bit later. And the, the final, the seventh example of two subjects that we have in common is the, uh, the traveler rescuing the goldsmith. Roxburgh says about this, it manifests the greatest divergence between the Jalayarid early Timurid model and its reinterpretation in the 1420 manuscript. But I think it might be simpler and more accurate to summarize the relationship between the two as saying they look nothing like one another. So 
is there in fact, as Roxburgh claims, a dialectic relationship established between the original July Red paintings and the 1429 Timur paintings of the same subject? Is this just a matter of semantics with a group of earlier scholars asserting that only one of the subjects in common in these two manuscripts is a copy? And Roxburgh claiming that, well, okay, only one may be an exact copy, but emulation is a looser word and all seven directly engage the earlier paintings. Well, fortunately, there is indeed hitherto overlooked evidence that plainly shows that the painter or painters of the Timuran manuscript uh, were in fact copying from several sources. The evidence comes from uh, this painting on the right-hand side. It's a slightly earlier Kalila and Dimden manuscript dated 1413 and containing 19 small paintings. It's also in the top copy Sarai library and has a shelf number of R1023. In other words, one digit more than the Bison Gore copy 1022. And I believe that this could be more than merely felicitous and might even reflect that the two manuscripts have been bundled together ever since they ended up at the same time in Bison Gore's Kitab Khane. Uh, after the library of Iskandar Sultan was brought to Herat. The manuscript, in fact, was published in detail by Sophie Walzer in 1969, who suggested it was produced in a southern provincial atelier, an attribution that is subsequently not in question. So here, I think it's very clear that uh, such features as the, the frame saw, the pose of the monkey, Oops, sorry, this, uh, the uh, lack of the turban on the carpenter, the fact that he's half naked, I mean, slightly disguised here by a transparent veil in the Bison Court original, and the, the, the forward leaning pose, all of these indicate that uh, the painting on the right is very much the copy that the Timurid, uh, painter modeled his composition on. And just to show you the difference again between all three of these, you can compare uh, it with the July original at the bottom right, uh, the 1413 manuscript at the top right, and the Bisonkor manuscript on the left hand side. I think it's very clear which one is actually a copy of the other. What about some other paintings from the two manuscripts? Well, this is one from the episode where uh, the hares were terrorized by elephants and later tricked them by causing them to believe that the, the moon was angry with them. Uh, and here too, it's not an exact copy by any means, but certainly I think the, uh, the figure of the elephant comparisoned with a, a cloth with a prominent red square and a red band holding it under the belly uh, the jewels around the legs of the elephants. Uh, all of these, I think, tell us that the painting on the right-hand side was the model for the Bisonkor original on the left-hand side. Now, by no means all of the subjects that these two manuscripts have in common uh, are nearly identical. On the right hand side, we have the, the, uh, the greedy boar episode. Uh, the Bison Corps original on the left hand side is certainly not copying the manuscript in this episode. Uh, the Shuns of A versus the Lion episode, totally different in both of these cases as well. But if we look at uh, <clears throat> the three representations of Cardon A, the monkey riding the tortoise. Uh, I'm going to show you in the next painting the two examples from the earlier manuscripts reversed. You can see that uh, the Bisonkur one, which is in the middle here, possibly is a kind of combination of both of these. The, the pose of the monkey with the, uh, the hand furthest from us raised the way in which the, the tail is uh, pointing upwards is very close to the 
1413 Shiraz manuscripts, although the way in which the legs are astride the monkey here is close to the Gilliard example. So uh, it's possible that both sources could have contributed to the delineation of the original, uh, sorry, of the Baisongor uh, example in this case. Another example that is shared by all three is the flight of the tortoise. The uh, 1413 manuscript at the bottom doesn't even have any spectators within it. It does have the geese and the monkey and the tortoise within the text box, but uh, there's not a lot of similarity between any of these three, I think. Uh, and let's go back now, in fact, to the one that I mentioned earlier on, the perils of life for the man is escaping from the rabbit camel. You can see that uh, the surround is particularly, oops, sorry, let me go back here and just get my, uh, I'll just do the laser pointer. The surround is very much rocky, which is quite similar to the Cairo and Jalayarid example. The dragon head is raised, threatening the man from below, uh, not at all like the Jalayarid example. The froth coming from the Camel's mouth is present in both of the Gilliard examples, not in the original uh, uh, early Gilliard one. So I think there's a good case to be made in the fact that the, uh, the Bisoncor painters may have seen not necessarily this exact painting or these paintings, but there are, may have been other copies that we have lost uh, that the Bisoncor uh, painter could have been aware of. So I think that the evidence that I presented today is particularly interesting for its revelation that the pages of the finest manuscripts didn't necessarily restrict their copying to the three pages of earlier manuscripts judged to be within the canonical legacy of Persian painting as argued by Adamova. A good painter who take inspiration from a mediocre source as much as from an earlier masterpiece. Roxburgh has suggested that in light of the positive value attached to imitation in medieval Persian culture, the negative connotation of such terms should be suspended. As I noted at the beginning of this paper, copying manifests itself in many different ways in Persian painting. Should a shortcut taken by an artist be viewed pejoratively, even if it results in a project vastly superior to the model, and who would have been aware of this shortcut? One can acknowledge the likelihood of Adamova's model of three paintings and many royal manuscripts copying earlier models in order to assert the painter's place in the classical canon and his possible superiority. But of course, this only carries resonance if the viewer is aware of the earlier models. How likely was it that the copying we have revealed today from a decidedly minor manuscript was apparent to anyone other than the painter. This also raises another question regarding our potential ignorance of many similar cases. We can only make a guess of the percentage of illustrated manuscripts in any one period or place that have survived today versus those that were produced in total. But it's certainly likely that we have lost many, particularly many from provincial schools that on close inspection could have been used as models even by some of the finest metropolitan painters of the day. Ironically, in relation to the manuscripts we've been discussing earlier today, uh, earlier art historians were castigated by Roxburgh for not paying enough attention to the, quote, complex flows and spins of people, ideas, and objects, unquote. A greater attention to these can indeed enable one to do justice to the complications at work in the very numerous choices that artists had and made when responding or choosing not to respond to earlier paintings. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you. That was really very fascinating. <clears throat> but I think we are going to reserve our questions, aren't we, till the end? Uh, I mean, to the end of the panel.